Okay, so now that we know what sieves are, we'd like to use them for something. And one thing for which we can use them is to characterize sheaves. So maybe let me articulate this problem of characterizing sheaves first. This question of when a given pre-sheaf is a sheaf. And then I'll go into showing how sieves can be brought to bear on that problem. And I'll give both an internal and an external answer for that. So one answer using internal sieves and one answer using external sieves. Okay, so let me begin by articulating the question. And the question is this. Given some pre-sheaf f, so given x inside of O of x, which is equal to hom in the category of categories, from O of X op in two sets, also known as the category of pre sheaves on X. So, given a pre sheaf F on X, when is F a sheaf on X? So, we just want to know when a given pre sheaf uh, turns out to be a sheaf. I'm not going to recall the uh, sheaf condition. I'll just assume that you are familiar with that. But this is the question. We want to know when a given pre-sheaf is actually a sheaf. So now let's see how internal sieves can be brought to bear on this, and then we'll start talking about external sieves. So internal perspective. So maybe I should just give the condition first, uh, and then I'll go back and explain it. So I'll say f inside of O of x hat is a sheaf if and only if, if for all open sets u of x and for all covering sieves For all covering sieves S on U, the canonical map the canonical map from F of U into the inverse limit over all V inside of S of F of V is an isomorphism. So that's the way of using internal sieves to characterize sheaves. F is a sheaf if and only if for every open set U and every covering sieve F's on U, the natural map or the canonical map from F of U to the inverse limit over all the sets in S is an isomorphism. So now let me go through and sort of say what this means a little bit. So, well, there's nothing to say here, and we know what covering sieves are. So maybe I should start by saying we're sort of remembering what this guy is. So the limit over all v inside of s of f of v, well, you can characterize internal lim limits using uh, a universal property, and that's probably the cleanest way of doing it. But I'm just going to give um, a construction to be a little bit more concrete. So this is the set of all families, all families, say, s of v for V inside of S, such that um, whenever, whenever W is inside of V, we have that, we have that S of W is equal to the restriction of S of V. Yeah. So here, just to clarify, S of V, let me write this up here. S of V is an element in F of V. That's what's going on down here. So we're looking at families of elements in F of V. So for every V, we're picking some element S of V inside of F of V. And then this restriction map is the restriction map from F of V into f of w, and I'm just denoting that by restriction w inside of v. 
Okay, so we're looking at all the families which match, basically. We're looking at coherent families. We're looking at families which satisfy this restriction condition. And this is one concrete, uh, concrete way of constructing the inverse limit. So, yes, I don't think that there's uh, anything else to say about this. This is just one way of constructing the inverse limit. This is one way of parsing what that means. Okay. So that's what this guy is down here. Maybe I should say what this natural map is too. So if we had to find the inverse limit by using the universal property, um, then this map would be the one induced by that universal property. But we could also describe this map concretely. So we just described the inverse limit concretely. We can also describe this map concretely. And what this map is, this map from f of u into this inverse limit, what this map is, is the one that takes the element s inside of uh, f of u and maps it to the family consisting of the restrictions. So this is the restriction v inside of u of s over all v inside of s. OK, so we now know what this canonical map is. We know what the inverse limit is, and we're familiar with these things. So yeah, this is one way of characterizing sheaves by using internal sieves. So I'm not going to prove, at least not in the mainline videos, that this is true. I'm not actually going to prove that this condition, which I have just been giving here, is equivalent to the classical sheave condition, but it is. And this is one way of characterizing sheaves by using internal sieves. Okay, so let's move on to the external perspective. And this is, I mean, this is for intuition almost. Um, sort of this perspective is useful for kind of getting intuition, but the external perspective is really where the fun starts happening, even though it's a little bit harder to understand. So the external perspective. Okay. So. I guess I'll follow the same pattern above by giving the condition first and then explaining what things mean. So given uh, f inside of O of x hat is a sheaf if and only if for every u inside of O of x and every sieve, or covering sieve, or recovering sieve, which I'll write as s along i into h of u, the map from hom o of x of h of u into f Let's see, it should be going, yeah. Hom O of X S F. And I guess I'll call this guy I sharp is an isomorphism. Is an isomorphism. Okay, so this is the sheaf condition in the external perspective. And now let me go through what this actually means. So again, we don't have anything to say here. And again, we know what a covering sieve is. So maybe let me talk about what this map is. So, well, we have this inclusion from S into H of U. And that means that given a map from H of U into some pre-sheaf F, there'll be this induced map induced by composition, which we'll just call um, phi lower hat. So that's what the morphism is. That's what I is. Uh, I guess maybe the quicker way of saying this is that I sharp of phi is equal to phi of i. That's what this guy is. And yeah, the sheaf condition in the external world is just that that map is an isomorphism. 
So again, I'm not going to prove this, at least in the mainline videos, but this is true. And this is how you could use external sieves to characterize sheaves. Okay, so even though I'm not going to prove this in the main line, I would at least like to say a little bit about the philosophy behind it, because something interesting comes out of this. Okay, so to do that we need to recall an embedding that I briefly talked about earlier, or this idea of embedding O of X into the pre-sheaf category. So we have an embedding. I guess formally we're done now. Formally I've sort of uh, did what I said that I was going to do by giving the sheaf condition for both internal and external sieves. This is just some kind of vague philosophical remark now that I'm making. So the formal content is over. Okay, so given that caveat, we have this embedding from O of X into O of X hat, and this is Yoneda. So I like visualizing this by thinking that we have this little category O of X over here, and then we're using Yoneda to embed it in this huge uh, extra category. So let me badly redraw a copy of this guy. And this is O of X, and this is O of X. And we embedded it through Yoneda into some huge category O of X hat category of all pre-sheaves on X. Now, as I'd said earlier, um, this embedding will create sub-objects. So if we have some object U over here, we'll have H of U over here. And sure, we'll have all of the old sub-objects in the sense that if I had some subset V of U over here, this inclusion that we'll still get that over here. But there will also be many more sub-objects of each of you in this larger category. So maybe we'll call this one S, and this one will be S prime, and this one will be S double prime. There might be many more sub-objects in this larger category. Okay. Now some of these extra sub-objects, these extra sub-objects are of course just sieves, by the way. So some of these extra sub-objects, some of these sieves, will be covering sieves, and some of them won't. So some will be covering sieves and some won't. And now, what this condition over here was telling us is that from the point of view of sheaves, a covering sieve on U is equivalent to U itself. So from the perspective of a sheaf, there's no difference between H of U, there's no difference between U, and a covering sieve on U. So let me say what I mean by that. So we have this larger category O of X hat, and inside of that there'll be some slightly smaller category. So there'll be some category maybe looking something like this, which we'll call O of X tilde. And o of X tilde, that's the category of sheaves. That's the category of sheaves on X. Okay. So in O of X tilde, in O of X tilde, we have that H of U is isomorphic to any, well, to, I guess, S, if S is a covering sieve, is a covering sieve on U. And this is a big deal, right? So we have these extra functors, these extra sub-objects S, and whenever S is a covering sieve, at least in the sheaf category, at least in this category, it's actually isomorphic to the thing it covers. So each of you is going to be isomorphic to this covering sieve S. And why is that? Well, that's because of this condition, which we were talking about over here, this isomorphism, right? Because what we have, 
just to repeat the condition is that for all um, you know for I guess for any for any f inside of O of x tilde there is an isomorphism there's an isomorphism from hom and O of x hat which is the same thing as the hom set in O of x tilde from h of u f into hom O of x tilde of s f. And this isomorphism is natural. So this is really an isomorphism between this functor and this functor. But by Yoneda again, this implies that h of u, this implies that h of u is isomorphic to s in O of x tilde. And now we can kind of start to see what's going on here with all of this abstract nonsense, is that that's really kind of what we want to capture by the idea of a covering sieve. A covering sieve is sort of a sub-object of h of u, which we want to consider as equivalent to u from the sheaf perspective. So sheaves are really what we care about. And so really we want to conflate. We want to conflate covering sieves on u with u itself, because from the perspective of sheaves, they're the same thing. And really that's what we're kind of uh, trying to do here. Well, anyway, that's kind of a, enough uh, vague nonsense for now, so I will end this video here.